All right, good evening. Let's <clears throat> see you all here tonight. If you have your hymnal, let's all stand and let's turn to hymn number 41. Jesus is the sweetest name I know. Hymn number 41. Good to have you here tonight. Do trust you've had a good day. Hope you was able to stay in the house most of the day with air conditioning, right, Miss Irene? And uh, so, uh, her air conditioning is giving her a fit. They come and uh, diagnosed it as bad. And uh, so she has had it replaced, and that won't be until Wednesday. Uh, so you be in prayer for her as she's kind of trying to nurse it along a little bit until then. She'll be in prayer for her in the situation there. Got a whole host of our folks are traveling, so be in prayer for them as they're on the road, if they make it back safely. And then many of them are sick as well, so be in prayer for all these different folks that have these uh, different things we can pray about. And then do be in prayer for a revival starting on next Sunday with Brother Scott Pauley. Sunday morning, Sunday night, Monday night, and Tuesday night. Uh, regular times on Sunday, 6.30, Monday and Tuesday night. And then kind of the conclusion of that will be on Wednesday night with a tour group coming in from Golden State Baptist College. And they'll be here at 6.30 as well. And be with us on Wednesday night. So let's be in prayer uh, for those upcoming events. Ask God to do something wonderful in our own heart. Uh, because until he does something in our heart, we can't expect him to do in anything in the life of anyone else, right? So let's ask God to help us with that. Many of our folks I mentioned having some difficulties. So let's be in prayer for them uh, health-wise and different things. And uh, good to have some visitors here with us this morning and tonight as well. Good to have these. Uh, some of them that have been on the road, like my family and I, back. We are so glad to be back. And then uh, Miss Juline's been a traveler this summer a little bit, and she's back and planted, right? And we're glad, thankful for that. And she's leaving again, though. I know. she. And BJ's been a traveling, but she's leaving again as well. But you're not going anywhere, Emily, right? You're staying right here. Right, Emily? You're, you're not going anywhere, right? Good. Miss Melda, you're staying right here, right? Well, you talk to the company you keep there, all right? And, uh, and, uh, but good to have them here. And do be in prayer for Miss Jen as she's there recovering. And, uh, and then Brother Bill with his fall, uh, whether broken rib or bruised or whatever, but he's very, very sore and unable to get around. Be in prayer for Beulah, Mel to Beulah, Beulah Merritt as she continues to recover uh, from the pneumonia there. And uh, Aaron as he continues to recover from his cough. And then my grandmother fell this morning. Again, so be in prayer for her as we don't know exactly what uh, damage or what you know, has occurred from the fall, but be in prayer for her as she's been having, she's been doing much, much better, but things like this definitely puts a setback on her, so be in prayer 
about that and then uh, so many other folks having some dif uh, difficulties. Okay, let's pray together and ask God's blessing upon the service tonight. It is good to have you here, and let's ask God to, to speak to us. Lord, we come to you tonight. We thank you for all that you've done. We thank you for this day you've given us the opportunity to be here. Thank you, Lord, for the privilege to call upon uh, not only a God, Lord, but the God, the King of kings, the Lord of lords. Uh, Lord, we're so thankful that uh, by grace, Lord, that you've opened up the way where we can access, have access to the very throne of of mercy and grace on a daily basis, Lord. We don't have to go through uh, some imperfect man or through some process, Lord. We have access through the blood of Christ to the throne of grace. I ask you, Lord, to be with us this evening. Thank you, Lord, for all this day that you've given us, for the attendance we had this morning as well as this evening. Although many of our folks are traveling and many are sick, Lord, we're so thankful for the faithfulness of your people to the house of God. Thank you, Lord, for the traveling mercies you showed my family and I as we were on the road and bringing us back safely again. I ask you now, Lord, to be with our services this evening. Speak to us, guide us, use your word to strengthen us, Lord, as we prepare our hearts for the revival up and coming. I ask you, Lord, be with better Paul, we lay upon his heart what, he, what you would have for us, that he may deliver it in the way that you would have it delivered. We thank you, Lord, for all your blessings, all of your mercy, all of your grace. Our Lord, as always, we ask you, Lord, in this service, if anyone is unsaved, if they've never had the blood of Christ applied to their life, uh, Lord, I pray that this evening they would realize their need of a Savior, and by faith they would receive you and ask you to come into their heart. We thank you, Lord, for Calvary and for the salvation you provide freely to all those that believe. We ask you now to be with us and guide us. Have all these things and use them for your glory in Christ's name. Amen. You may be seated. Let's sing some more. All right, let's turn over to hymn number 46, Crown Him with Many Crowns. Hymn number 46. this morning a new month birthdays and anniversaries and uh so get, do be in prayer for all these it's up and coming uh miss mccullough uh, on the 8th miss irayla on the 9th uh, brendan on the 20th be in prayer uh for brendan and he uh, uh got saved back during bible school last year and he was trying to get a uh, baptismal uh, lined up for him and he was trying to get all the family rounded up and it's just been kind of put off and put off and put off but if the lord allows and the family cooperates we're planning on doing that this coming sunday so be in prayer for brendan and then rebecca's on the 21st 
Corals on the 24th. Don't forget about the birthday party uh, here this Saturday at 1 o'clock at the church. They'll be in the next building over. And then Crystal's on the 25th, Sincere on the 29th, and Miss Cindy on the 30th. And then Jack and Rochelle Strickland had an anniversary on the 8th. Is that correct, Butter Jack? Yes, and uh, that's that was what Miss Miss Michelle or Miss Rochelle told me too, and uh, and then Ray and Gloria has one up and coming on the twenty third. So uh, be in prayer for all these folks, these anniversaries, anniversaries birthdays. I do be in prayer for our revival uh, starting on next Sunday. Amen. Uh, but Rick, if you would ask for the blessing, what do you offer? to hymn number 137, Take the Name of Jesus with You. 137. <clears throat>
think Sarah's going to come and sing for us tonight, so let's be in prayer for her. Are you singing with her, Rebecca? All righty, Sarah and Rebecca will be singing for us tonight. When clouds of doubt hover o'er me, angry winds toss me to and fro, there is a place that I can go. He's a shield from every tempest. He's an anchor that is sure in times like these. It's good to know God is my refuge, a strong and mighty tower that I can run to. God is my refuge without Him. Once I wandered from the shelter, just ahead I could not see the dark clouds so heavy with rain. Angry clouds blew hard against me. He called out and I ran to him, and now I am safe from the storm. Thank you, ladies. Appreciate that. If you have your Bible tonight, you'll be turning over to Acts chapter 26. Acts chapter 26. And uh, I do encourage you the next couple of days, unless you need to be outside uh, between 10 and 4 or something like that, middle day, 10 and 5 in the evening or whatever, I'd encourage you to try to stay in out of the sun as much as possible, drink plenty of water, uh, because it is going to be warm. And uh, heat exhaustion is a very real thing, and uh, so I'd encourage you to do that. And if there is something that arises, comes up with, uh, like Miss Irene, your air conditioner or something like that, uh, please let us know that we can maybe try to get some help to you some way if we need to be. And uh, we can have you come stay with us or whatever we need to do, get you a room, whatever uh, we need to do. We don't want anyone to be having problems, so uh, you let us know about that. If something arises, that we may be able to help you, okay? And I do... I thank the Lord for what He's done for us. In Acts chapter 26, tonight we're going to just look at a couple of verses and we're going to move quickly into a few more passages here uh, back in chapter 27. But I just want to uh, kind of, as we have had Father's Day today and we've had a good day, we, uh, at least for my family, we went to Firehouse Subs because it was where I chose to go because it was Father's Day. And we had our sandwiches over there and and I had the brisket sub, and it was very, very good. And my wife, I think, had the hook and ladder. And I don't know what all the rest of them had, but it was very good. And, and we enjoyed that and went over there. Then we came home and, and uh, played some uh, games, and there was no nap. They wouldn't let me take a nap. Galena said that I was allowed to take a nap while we was playing the game if I wanted to. She was much kinder than my family. But nevertheless, uh, we had a little time there and was laughing and cutting up and then come back to church tonight. We're thankful for that. And... Uh, and when we think about Father's Day, though, this morning I tried to give an illustration of what it means for us to have a heavenly father and, and that relationship and how we are no longer servants and how uh, once you trust Christ your Savior, He is your heavenly father and, and you get a very special relationship because you get to call Him by a name that you didn't get to call Him by before. Uh, he's not only father like the world were to refer father. He is a very close relation. He's personal to you now. 
and that word Abba Father there that we looked at this morning and talking about that. But tonight I want to, I want to just kind of give an encouragement to not only the fathers and the mothers and the grandparents, but also to every person in this room tonight about when we go through life and the challenges we're going to face. Our challenges are all going to be different. Our backgrounds are different. Our future is going to be different. Now, the circumstances we face tomorrow is going to be different. But here's the thing about it. Our Heavenly Father knows what we're going through. He knows what we will be going through before we do, and he'll know, He knows what it takes to get us through it more than we'll ever know. So we need to rely upon Him and lean upon Him. Uh, uh, Crystal and I, I sh shared with you this morning, I think it was in Sunday school, about the fact that we had an opportunity while we were back there visiting our family to visit m much of our family, maybe more than we get to sometimes. We, as she got to spend, we got to spend probably four or five nights with her mother, and she, we got to see uh, her sister and and brother-in-law, and, and I didn't get to see Jeremy, but she and, and got to see Jeremy and spend some time with him and, and some, her brother and, and some other family members and be in prayer for that. She uh, has some family members that's been diagnosed or going through the diagnosis process right now, some very serious health issues, some young family members, our age and, un, uh, and younger, with some very serious health issues. I got to see my grandmother, of course, my an aunt and uncle who's growing up in and in, in, getting up in years and facing more issues, and another, a few uncles and aunts and, and some family members there. And then we got to, of course, be at the church for mom and dad's rededication. And, and it was a lot of family time we had, to, we had the opportunity to, to enjoy it together. Uh, and, and we're so thankful for that. And yet, as we leave and come back to Arizona, Arizona, we know that some of those family members, either her side of the family or mine, we may never get to see on earth again. I mean, reality is we may, but we may not. We, none of us have any idea what tomorrow holds for us or anyone else. And by that, we don't know what happens with the economy, with our government. Just this past week, our government was attacked, again, by some people from our country, a man from our country. We don't know what's going to happen in the future. But I want to say to you, no matter what we face, no matter what circumstances we're going through, there's someone that we can rely upon, we can lean on. There's someone that can see us through if we'll just follow Him. Our homes are under attack. No doubt about it. Our homes are under very serious attack. And as our homes are under attack, we have to determine where we're going to stand today. Because the battle is going to rage on. The battle may even become more fierce in days to come. So we need to determine where we stand and why we stand there so that as our home comes under attack, we continue to stand because we know why we stand there. Why do we love this country? I mean, if this country changes, does our love for this country change? If, if the politicians make laws that we don't agree with or, or reinforce laws or allow laws that we don't stand for, we stand against, we believe is, that is unbiblical, do we still stand with this country? Or is our stand for this country based upon our feelings? And I say that because I want to challenge you this evening. Our stand for Christ and the things of the Bible should never be based upon a feeling. It should be founded and foundational in God's Word. God's Word doesn't change because it's His Word and He doesn't change. And if He doesn't change, then we're not to change. No matter what our circumstances, things doesn't change. We're going to be looking at the book of Acts tonight, the book of, of action, if you will. The first century church has just been birthed. Christ has just birthed the church and, and he's developed and, and discipled some men to start these early churches and he's sending them out now and they're being a witness and great things are accomplished. But you can guarantee when great things are accomplished for the glory of God, the devil is, a, is wakened and he attacks very seriously and very ferociously. And he attacks here, these early churches, and he attacks the Apostle Paul and the Apostle Paul being an amazing man, not perfect. He was a man of like sinful temptations as you and I and compassions of the flesh like you and I. But yet, because he determined to give his heart to the Lord and his life to the Lord, and he tried to live for the Lord and please the Lord, he even says, I'm the chiefest among sinners. And he even declares for us from the pages of Scripture, God records for us that Paul even felt like the things that I don't want to do is what I find myself doing, and the things that I do want to do is what I have trouble finding myself engaging in. Anybody else ever feel like that sometimes? Our heart... Uh, the spirit is willing, the flesh is weak, right? Our heart longs to be like Christ, and yet our flesh stumbles sometimes. Paul is no different than us, but he gave his life to the Lord, and he gave his life to the purpose that God gave for his life. And in doing so, we find it recorded, much of it recorded for us in God's Word. In Acts chapter 26, as Paul now has been taken prisoner, 
he's standing here before uh, Festus, and, and he says in verse 24, Paul, thou art beside thyself, much learning hath made thee mad. But he said, I am not mad, most noble Festus, but speak forth the words of truth and soberness. Verse 26 of chapter 26, And the king knoweth of these things, before whom also I speak freely, for I am persuaded that none of these things are hidden from him, for this thing is not done in a corner. Paul says, listen, I'm standing here testifying, and you're accusing me of being mad and insane and out of my mind, but I'm telling you, he says, everyone in here knows my life and my testimony. I've not done it secretly. I've lived the same for Christ since the day I received him, and my testimony for him has been intact. He said, I'm not mad. What I'm saying, he said, he said what I'm saying, I love this. He says, he says, the king knoweth of these things. What I'm declaring today before the court is not, not news to the king. Isn't that an amazing thing that Paul could say that? God had given him a witness to the king even when Paul wasn't communicating with the king. He, he had given him a witness to the king because of his life of Christ, for Christ. It's often been said that all of us have a sermon to preach and we preach that sermon with our life. And none of us know who is listening and who is watching, but I say to you, if someone is watching everyone. We have no idea who we're influencing. I've often thought about some things. Even the past few weeks we were away from here, my heart longing to be here and thinking about some things. I thought about going through some of these, while we were dra traveling and driving, and most of my family loves to sleep when they travel, so uh, there's much alone time in the truck how's that and uh and, and, and as we are driving through the night and different days and things like that i think about a lot of things i was thinking about our church and and 11 and a half years we're just over 11 and a half years old i was thinking about what god has done honestly i i know maybe in the world's eyes i mean people's eyes it's like god's not done much of anything but i say that he's done so much in my own heart i mean i've seen from those early days when when we had a sign in the yard of a house and, and we was knocking on doors and no one was showing up for church. And we just kept trying to be faithful. Sunday school, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. And week after week after week after week, not a single visitor. We just knew what God had called us to do. And God done some amazing things even in those days at reinforcing for my family what God had called us to do. And He called us here for a purpose and we wasn't going to back up and move away from what he gave us to butter strickland we had been here just for a month matter of fact the church was just a month old we've been here about two months the church about a month old and we had a death that we had to travel back to tennessee for a sudden death and, and butter strickland filled in for me and there was no one there that day <laughs> you know church was a month old and no one was at church here's the amazing thing about it but in those days when it was just my wife and my kids and, and they laugh and joke about it and say we knew who he was preaching to well, it wasn't me. It was just the Lord was doing some things in our life those days to reinforce us of why we were here. We didn't come here for the crowd. We didn't come here for the people. We came here because Christ led us here. And our sole responsibility was to follow Him and obey, and obey Him. And that was it. And if we obey Him, then we find His blessings and we find His grace and we find His mercy. And the Bible says we, we are rewarded according to our faith. And I wonder sometimes if maybe we miss out on so many blessings because our faith is weak. Seriously. We just tried to be faithful. We had people come and visit. And many of those early uh, people that came to the church, and I was thinking about this just in the past few weeks about our church, and we had an opportunity to visit a church in Dandridge, Tennessee, when, when we were back there, where one of the young men in our church, a young family, I should say, in our, that was in our home church, now has left that church and taken a church in Dandridge. And we went to visit him and encourage him on a Wednesday night. And I, I was talking to him, we went to supper before the service, and we were talking. I asked him, how long has the church been there? It had been there nearly five decades. It was nearly 50 years old. And, 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 and he said, uh, or maybe it's 30, was it 38 years or 42 years? Okay, around 40, 42 years, something like that church had been there. And, and he said, we don't have but just a couple of our charter members left. And I thought, that's amazing. Honestly, we don't have but a few of our charter members left, and we're in not quite that old, you know. I mean, and some of them have already passed on to glory, and we praise the Lord about that. And some of them have just moved away. But we have a few charter members even in the room tonight. You know, and we're thankful for that. But it's, being a charter member doesn't give special privileges or, or 
more voting rights or anything in the future. It just means that these are some of the most faithful people that have been here since the earliest days of our church. And they're still intact. And, and it's an amazing thing. The faithfulness of everyone is rewarded. And we've got people in our church that have come along and influenced my family and I. And there's been those that have come into our church that, that, that were wolves in sheep's clothing that we had to be on guard for. And we kind of had to make them realize that they could not be comfortable here as a wolf. And they wasn't, and they aren't here anymore. Really. And we had those that came in uh, that was innocent, they were unsaved, that, that, that didn't know the Savior, and they'd come to know Christ, and, then they, and they got plugged in, and they were growing, and, and then maybe some of them are still around, and some of them have moved on, and, they, and maybe a job or a health or something has relocated them now. But nevertheless, I was thinking about some of those folks that have come through our church and, and have influenced my family, and we have many people that have come through that are not here. We have many people that still re remain, but don't get me wrong. We've had many people over 11 years that have come through our church and now are somewhere else, whether it be in glory or somewhere else on this earth, but they've come through here. And can I say this? Everyone has had an influence on us. Good or bad, there was an influence. Right? Really. And even the bad influences are, are good in the sense that we learn by our by those things. We learn by those uh, ex things that we go through, those experiences. And Paul here is in, in jail, and he's a prisoner, and he's brought before the court, and he declares these truths, and they say, you're, you're, you're crazy, Paul, you're mad. He says, listen, nothing I've done has been done in a corner. The king knows my life. He knows my testimony. It's an amazing thing. I love this. He says in verse 20, 27, King Agrippa, believest thou the prophets? He turns, he says, the king knows this. He said, he turns them directly to the king. Can you imagine that? He turns to the king now and says, King Agrippa, believest thou the prophets? Question mark. And then Paul answers his own question. I know that thou believest. <laughs> That's an amazing thing. But then he says in verse 28, Then Agrippa said unto Paul, Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. What I'm going to talk about tonight is this. Do you know the Bible? Or do you live the Bible? King Agrippa, believe us thou the prophets. Do you believe the writings of God's word, what they had up until that point? I know thou believest. You know my life, King. I know you believe the prophets. And then Agrippa's reply is, almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. Knowing the Bible is so far different than having the God of the Bible in your heart. There's a huge difference there. Knowing the Bible. I know many people that know the Scriptures. They know so much of the Bible. Uh, when I was in Israel back in 2007, our tour guide was a Palestinian Muslim. This guy knew the Old Testament and New Testament for that matter. He knew the Bible, I mean, in vivid imagery detail. I mean, I, honestly, he was, a, he was an amazing guide. And yet when I talked to him about Christ, he didn't believe Christ was the Savior of man. He was a Muslim. And yet he knew the Bible so much. He knew the Bible. He knew, I mean, honestly, he would tell us about these places we'd go and see him, and he'd say, and he just talked about it like we, like he was living there when it happened. And I'd get back in the bus, and between the start, next stops, I'd be going through my Bible trying to find what he just told me about. I thought, man, this guy knows his Bible. I wish I knew the Bible that well. So I may be lacking in some of the knowledge of the Bible. But I don't want to be lacking anything in, in the knowledge of my Savior. I want to be right in my heart. I don't want to doubt or question or fear my eternity. The most miserable life a person can live is one of fear of where they spend eternity, of uncertainty, and of, un, of, of un, instability, not knowing. Well, I hope so. I think so. I would not want to risk my eternity on a hope so, honestly. I would not want to spend my life hoping I get to heaven because guess what the alternative is? It's hell. There's nothing else. I wouldn't want to risk my life, live my life, 
Well, I think I'm going. So the Bible says these things are written that you may know that you have eternal life. The Bible tells for us that we can know we have Christ as our Savior. It's not a think so, a hope so. It's a know so. We can know so. Paul says these things have been done and open. The king says, almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. Look at the response. And Paul said to the king in verse 29, I would to God that, that not only thou, but also all that hear me this day were, were both almost and altogether such as I am. Notice this, comma, accept these bonds. This is a powerful phrase. As Paul stands before a court that he's in prison for only for proclaiming Christ. He's not, done any, he's not been a thief, a robber, a murderer. He's standing there in court because he's been witnessing and testifying and preaching. That's it. He's now brought before the king. He appealed to Caesar. He's been brought before the king. And, and Festus is there. And we have King Agrippa. He's going to be moved again. But, but we have this process taking place. And there Paul says, listen, my life has been, it's been an open book. It's not been done in a corner in secret. The king knows how I've been living my life. And the king says, almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. Paul says, not only thou, not only you, king, but I wish that everyone in here was like me, except for the bonds. That is such a powerful statement for a man that's been accused and being brought to court, and he's not wishing that upon anyone else. He's not wishing anyone else to be in bond. He's not wanting to trade places with anyone. He's just saying, I wish you was like me. <laughs> not in bonds, not that way, not in prisoner, no, no. I wish that you knew Christ as your Savior. Look at the next verse, verse 30. And when he had thus spoken, the king rose up, and the governor, and Bernice, and they sat with him, with them, and they that sat with them, Verse 31, and when they were gone aside, they talked between themselves, saying, This man doeth nothing worthy of death or of bonds. <laughs> We've never had anybody in a court like this before, they say. I mean, he says, not only you, king, but everyone else. I wish it was like me. Not just knowing, but knowing. Right? Not just knowing it, but believing. I don't want you to be in bonds like me. But I want you to be a Christian. I want you to know Christ. They all rise up. They convene back here for a special discussion. Can you see the news reports today? If this was in court, in a court, and the news media was in there, all of a sudden they say, we don't know what's happening. The king and all the judges and all the jurors have risen out of their seats and they've, they've moved back into a corner. We don't know what they're talking about. And can you, can you imagine the suspense? Can you imagine this? And they turn and they come back. And they determine that this man's done nothing worthy of bonds. Why is he a prisoner? This man has done nothing worthy of bonds. Does it sound like anyone else from Scripture? Now granted, Paul was not sinless. But he was saved by the grace of God. His sin was covered. But there was also another one that stood in your place and my place that made it possible for us to be as Paul was declaring that he wanted them to be. And that was Christ. And when he stood before Pilate, Pilate washed his hands before the crowd and basically said, I find no fault in this man. You know why he, why he didn't find a fault? There was no fault. <laughs> there was no fault in him. And he symbolically washed his hands in front of the crowd and basically says, his blood is on you now, not on me, because I would like to release him. And the crowd cried out, crucify him. So Paul now has been declared that there's nothing worthy of, of death or of bonds and, and then set a grip unto Festus. This man might have been set at liberty if he had not appealed unto Caesar. I said, do you realize if this guy had just played his cards right, he wouldn't be where he's at today? <laughs> but we can't set him free. We're going to have to look at chapter 27. We're going to do it hurriedly, but, but I want you to see something. Look at verse well, he's being moved. And when it was determined, verse, chapter 27, verse 1, that we should sail into Italy, they de delivered Paul and certain other prisoners unto one named Julius, a centurion of Augustus' band. And entering into a ship, uh, we launched in meaning to sail by the coast of Asia. One, 
Ar Aristarchus, uh, a Macedonian of Thessalonica being with us. And the next day we touched to Zidon and Julius courteously entreated Paul and gave him liberty to go into his friends to refresh himself. Verse 4. And when he had launched from thence, we sat under Cyprus because the winds were contrary. Paul's life is just, people say, poor Paul. He just can't catch a break. He's in jail. He's in prison. They would like to turn him loose, but they can't because of the appeal to Caesar. So they put him on a boat. He gets on the boat, and, and storms come up, and now the winds are blowing, and the winds are contrary. And Paul just can't catch a break, man. It says in verse 5, And when we had sailed over the sea of Cilicia into Pamphylia, we came to Myra, sea of Lycia. And there the centurion found a ship of Alexandria sailing into Italy, and he put us therein. So he's changed ships again. And when we had sailed slowly many days, and scarce were come over against us, sighted us, the wind not suffering us, we sailed under Crete over against Salome, or Sa Salmon. And hardly passing it came into a place which is called the Fair Havens. Nigh whereunto was the city of Lacia. Now when much time was spent, this is important. Now when much time was spent and when sailing was now dangerous because the fast was now already passed, Paul admonished them and said unto them, Sirs, I perceive that this voyage will be with hurt and much damage, not only of the lading and of ship, but also of our lives. Can you imagine Paul the prisoner saying, Listen, I don't think we should sail. The weather's too bad. Uh, the wind is bad. The weather's bad. The sea's bad. Uh, I don't think we should set sail. We, 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 shouldn't, we shouldn't set sail. Well, yeah, right, Paul. You're just wanting to, you, you just want to stay right here. You, you, don't, you know what you're facing. You don't want to sail on. That's not what it is. Paul's the reason they're sailing in the first place. <laughs> Nevertheless, the centurion believed the master and the owner of the ship more than those things which were spoken by Paul. I have to stop here because I'm going to say a little thing funny. Laugh with me when I say this, all right? Has a preacher ever advised against something and you did it anyway? Paul says, uh, I don't believe we should do that. The centurion, but the centurion set sail anyway. Right? Now listen, the preacher just a preacher, just a man of like passion, like temptation, just like you and I. But I say to you, Paul was being used of the Lord in a mighty way and for a purpose. And when Paul said, we, we shouldn't set sail. Because if we set sail, there's going to be much harm to the ship and even possibly to our own lives. The weather is not good. I know I'm just a prisoner, but I'm telling you, we shouldn't set sail. But set sail anyway, verse, verse 12, and because uh, the haven was not uh, commodious to winter in, the more... Uh, part, advised to depart, thence also if by any means they might attain to Phoenix and there to winter, which is in haven of Crete, and lieth toward the southwest and northwest. And verse 13, I'm going to have to hurry. And when the south wind blew softly, supposing that they had obtained their purpose, loosing thence, they sailed close by Crete. They said, oh, the wind's laid, back, laid down, it's not blowing as hard, let's go ahead and, and let's, let's cut loose and let's start sailing while the wind's just gently blowing. Sometimes, in our reality, what we see with our eye is not really what's happening. Sometimes our flesh is, is denied the truth, <laughs> you know. We perceive something to be one way, but it's not the way it is. But not long after, there arose against a tempestuous wind called Eurocladon. This is a, a, a typhoon wind from the east. This is like a, a typhoon this is not just a, a normal storm. This is a very serious storm. A tempestuous wind from these called Eurocladon. And when the ship was caught and could, and we, and, and could not bear it up into the wind, we let her drive. In other words, we, we can't handle her. If we raise the sails, the ship's going to be turned over. If we try to steer the, the ship, we can't overcome the waves. We're just going to let the wind take her where she wants to keep the, the ship afloat. The best we can do now is ask for mercy. <laughs> We can do nothing. It's out of our controls. We're just going to let her drive, you know. The best we can do is let her go. All we're doing is just letting the ship go. We can't overcome this wind. We can't overcome these waves. This tempestuous sea is too strong. It's too, it's too powerful. We can't do it ourselves. We're just going to let her drive. You ever had anything in your life where you just had to let go? 
I've shared with you in the past one of the hardest prayers that I ever had to pray, and I've prayed it since, but learning to pray this prayer was with my grandfather, and it was a hard thing to learn to pray this prayer, but I'm thankful I learned to pray this prayer. Well, my grandfather, my mom's dad, he was one of my heroes in all honesty. I never knowed anything that my granddaddy did that was wrong. I know he was just a man. I never knew anything he did that was wrong. Nothing. And when he was dying in the hospital, we've been praying and praying and praying for him to be healed. And all of a sudden, it just dawned on me one day from the scriptures that the Bible says that we're to pray his will be done. And I'm going to be honest with you. I was 21 years old. My wife and I were newly married. The hardest thing I have ever had to learn to do in my life was learn to pray that prayer. I'm thankful I learned to pray that prayer because I've used it many times since because I realize His will is always better than mine. His purpose and His plan is way better than mine. But it was hard for me to say, God, I'm, it was easy for me to say, God, I'm trusting you to heal my grandfather. Heal him, heal him, heal him. Lord, I'm trusting you to heal my grandfather. It was hard for me to say, Lord, but if that's not your will. <laughs> See, it's easy for me to hang on to something in this world and hang on to someone in my life and hang on to them and say, God, I'm trusting you to keep them in my life. It's so much harder to say, God, it's yours. Do what you want. Whether it be a job, a family member, finances or health or whatever, it, that's hard. But I, I came to that place in my life where I realized I, I just got to let her drive. This is in the Lord's hands. I, I can't fight this. I have no power to overcome this. This is a battle that I can't win. And I just had to let her go. The Bible says in verse 17, which when they had taken up, they used helps undergirding the ship and fearing lest they should fall into the quicksand, straight sail, and so, and so were driven and and we, being exceedingly tossed with a tempest, the next day they lighted the ship. And the third day we cast out with our own hands the tackling of the ship. Three days of this storm so far. It's not just a, a passing storm for 10 or 12 hours. This is three days. They've been in the same storm for three days. And now they're throwing their tackling overboard. They've already cast out everything they didn't need. And now they're literally throwing the tackling of the ship overboard. Verse 18 and... We'll, and we being exceedingly tossed with a tempest, the next day we, they lighted the ship, and the third day we cast out with our own hands attacking the ship. And when neither sun nor stars in many days appeared, and no small tempest lay on us, all hope that we should be saved was then taken away. Many days now, not just three days, many days. We're going to give you, look with us. But after long abstinence, Paul stood forth in the midst of them and said, Don't you love this preacher? Sirs, you should have hearkened unto me. <laughs> and not loose from Crete and to have gained this harm and loss. Oh, my goodness. Paul, in the bottom of the ship, they're hunkered down. They can't do anything. They've already lightened the ship all they could. They can't do anything. For many days they've been in this storm. They can't do anything. And Paul stands up in the middle of all of them and says, I told you. I told you so. We should never have left Crete. <laughs> An amazing story. He says in verse 22, And now I exhort you to be of good cheer. What? Paul, you just finished telling us that I told you so. And now you're telling us to be of good cheer? To not worry? You're telling us to have hope? You're telling us to be strong? He said, Be of good cheer, for there shall no loss of any man's life among you but of the ship. He said, i got news for you. We're going to lose the ship. But we're not going to lose anyone's life. You're not even a sailor, Paul. This is not your ship. You're a prisoner. What are you doing? Who do you think you are telling us this? He says, for there stood by me, verse 23, this night the angel of God, whose I am and whom I serve. You realize the same message he's delivering here in the bottom of the ship in the middle of a storm 
is the same message he delivers as he stands before the king. It, it, this is who I am because of him. I am nothing, but I'm his and I serve him. And he says, this angel told me, Fear not, Paul, that thou, thou must be brought before Caesar. And lo, God hath given thee all them that sail with thee. He says, let me tell you why I can say what I've said. It's not because I'm smarter than you. It's not because I'm more intelligent. I have more experience than you. I'm telling you this because the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, gave me this news. Our lives are going to be spared because he has a plan for everyone on this ship. And the plan for my life is I'm going to stand before Caesar. By the way, that's why he was on the ship <laughs> in the first place. So he, may, he play, had a position to stand from the beginning. I'm going to stand, I'm going to walk, I'm going to talk, I'm going to be like Christ with all that is in me. I'm not perfect. It's the things that I don't want to do I find myself doing. The chiefest among sinners, he says. But I'm not going to let my life be defined by defeat. I want victory through Jesus. He determines before King Agrippa, I wish that you and everyone in this room was like me. Not in bondage, no, 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 not in bonds, but in Christ. They find nothing in him to kill him or to keep him in prison for. But nevertheless, they have to take him before Caesar. They put him on a boat and on another boat, and now they set sail. The wind, the storm, the tempestuous, the, the, the Eurocladon, the, 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 the typhoon-type conditions, and now many days, we find out 14 days later, we find out. 14 days of this storm they've endured. And in doing so, his position has not changed. He still stands in the hull of that ship, the same place he stood before the king. I am his, and he's whom I serve. And because I am his, and he's whom I serve, he's given me the message of service he has for me. I have to go before Caesar. We're going to lose the ship, but no one else's life will be lost. He says, Wherefore, sirs, be of good cheer, for I believe God that it shall be even as it was told me. Verse 26, Howbeit we must be cast upon a certain island. There's something going to happen, guys. We're not going to make our destination. <laughs> we'll have a little bit of a detour. We're going to get shipwrecked. Cast, not landed. <laughs> you see what I mean? We're not going to pull into, into dock somewhere. We're going to crash. There's going to be a shipwreck. We're going to be cast upon an island. But it's not just an island. It's a certain island. When the 14th night, verse 27 says, was come, as we were driven up and down in Adria, about midnight the shipmen deemed that they drew nigh to some country. And they sounded and found it 20 fathoms, 120 foot of water. And when they had gone a little further, they sounded again and found it 15 fathoms. That's 90 feet of water. Then fearing lest we should have fallen upon rocks, they cast four anchors out of the stern and wished for the day. <laughs> Fourteen days of storm has been going on. Now they know they're getting close to land because the, the sea is getting more shallow, 120 feet, 90 feet. They said, we, we can't hit the rocks. And they cast out four anchors and wished for the day. <laughs> Just 14 days of darkness. He says here, and at verse 30, and the shipmen were about to flee out of the ship. They had let down the boat. And to see, this would be the, the uh, uh, lifeboats. Thank you. My mind just completely laid that aside. They were lowing down the lifeboats. The shipmen, the people of the ship, were gonna leave, they were going to flee. And, and I love this. He says, they're about to flee, verse 30. When they let down the under color as though they would have cast anchors out of the foreship, Paul said to the centurion and the soldiers, except these abide in the ship, you cannot be saved. I like the fact that Paul is not addressing those that are doubting. Paul's addressing the leaders, the centurion. He says, listen, they can do whatever they want, and you're the leader, but I'm telling you, what I told you earlier, the Lord sent message to me that None of our lives will be lost. The ship will be, but our lives won't be. But God has a plan for us. We have to follow His plan. And if they flee, they will be lost. There's no guarantee of their success because God has a plan for me. And unless we all stay together, we don't all escape. The centurion is an, ama it's an amazing story. The centurion then commands that they cut the ropes and turn the lifeboats loose. Can you imagine that? 14 days they've been in the storm. 
they're close enough to land where the lifeboats, surely the lifeboats can put them on land and surely some of them can be saved. And Paul says, listen, unless we stay together in this, God's plan is that some of, he has a plan for all of us and if any of us evacuate that plan, then there's no promise of their tomorrow. That's powerful, isn't it? Centurion cuts the ropes and commands them to be cut. And when he had thus spoken, he took, verse 35, he took bread and gave thanks to God in presence of them all. When he had broken it, he began to eat. Verse 36, then they were all of a good cheer and they also took some meat. They've just cut the lifeboats loose, but they've been fasting for 14 days. And now Paul, some meat and bread is given and they give thanks to God and now they they have good cheer. They're, they're rejoiced. They're refreshed. They're encouraged. Verse 37, and we were, and we were in all in the ship, 200, three score and 16. So it's 276 people. 276 people are on this boat. Does that give a new light to this story? This is not a, a boat of 30 or 40 people. 276 people. And all of them remain on the boat. The lifeboats have been cut. I, can I say to you this evening, we need to learn to live our life by faith and faith alone. If we don't learn to cut the lifeboats of this world loose and say, well, I'm trusting the Lord, but, but, but I'm just going to keep a little bit of reserve over here just in case. I'm going to go to church and try this thing of church and religion out, but just in case it don't work out, I'm going to keep this. We need to learn to cut those lifeboats loose. <laughs> Seriously. Because if we're trusting the world, whatever is not of faith is sin. And we cannot please the Lord in the flesh. God cannot be pleased by our flesh. Therefore, we have to trust Him and live in spirit and obedient to spirit. So the lifeboats have been cut. Meat has now been given. The fast has been broken. And they're starting to eat. And the Bible says in verse 39, And when it was day, they knew not the land. They still hadn't got there. But they discovered a certain creek. Say, where are we? I, I don't know. What's this island? I don't know. Remember that certain island? <laughs> God knew exactly where they were. They may not know where they were, but God knew where they were. Have you ever been in a situation in your life where I don't, I don't know what's going on? I don't know what's happening. I don't know what's happening. God does. Seriously. They didn't know where they were, but there was a creek. They're, 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 they've been changed now. They're, they're in good cheers. There's a certain creek with a shore into which they were minded, if it were possible, to thrust into the ship. And when they had taken up the anchors, they committed themselves into the sea and loosed the rudder bands and hoisted up the mainsail to the wind and made toward shore. And falling into a place where two seas meet, or two seas met, they ran the ship aground, and the forepart stuck fast and remained unmovable, but the hinder part was broken with the violence of the waves." Get this picture. They say, right there is where we need to be. We're going right up in that creek right there, that, right at that area. And the two seas are meeting right there, and the waves are, are, are pretty strong. And, and, they, and they lift the sail, and they're going, we're, going, we're heading towards land. Throttle down, sails up, right? Anchors are up, sails are up. Towards land we go. And they run, up, they run the, the boat up on the bank, and the front part of the ship lodges so hard in the land that it does not move. But the waves are so strong that they break the back of the ship off. 276 people's on board. This ship without a back is bound to sink. There's no way around it. So I love this story. Verse 42, And a soldier's counsel was to kill the prisoners, lest any of them should swim out and escape. But the centurion, willing to save Paul, catch that, our lives as a Christian is never done in a corner. We should never live our life as a secret service Christian. <laughs> well, I'm just not going to tell anybody I'm a Christian. I'm just, not going to, I'm, just going to, I'm just going to pray and read my Bible, but I'm never going to tell or witness to anybody. I'm afraid of what they'll say. If, if the centurion had not known who Paul was and his, and his faith in Christ, then this story would not be the same. They were going to kill the prisoners. Guess who was a prisoner? Paul. The centurion said, no, no, no. This one needs to be kept alive. So therefore, none of them are going to die. So they, they, basically, they basically make an order. He says, 
and commanded that they which could swim should cast themselves first in the sea and get to land. If you can swim, no matter if you're a prisoner or one of the guards, if you can swim, jump in the sea and start swimming, you know. And he says, and the rest, some on boards and some on broken pieces of the ship. And so it came to pass that they escaped all safe to land. That's a powerful chapter. I'll give you a couple things real quickly and we're finished. First of all, in chapter 21, I mean uh, chapter 27, verse 22, he says, And now I exhort you to be of good cheer, for there shall be no loss of any man's life among you but of the ship. For there stood by me this night the angel of God. Can I encourage you, no matter what you're going through in life, his presence is always there. His presence is always there. We have difficult days. Miss Emily's had three months of frustration, three months of, of aggravation, three months of being not at home, but he's always there. We may not look for him, but he's there. Verse 24, he says, Fear not, Paul, thou must be brought before Caesar. And lo, God hath given thee all them that have sailed with thee. So he had a plan and a purpose for Paul's life. And He always has a plan and a purpose for our life. It may not be like someone else's plan or purpose. Can I say to you this, this evening, this is, this is going to be extremely elementary, but if everyone was called to preach, there'd be something wrong with the church. Right? Too many cooks in the kitchen. <laughs> you know, literally. But He has a plan for your life. You work somewhere, you work at a factory, you work at a plant, you go to a school, whatever it is. You live in a community. He has a plan for your life. Embrace that purpose and that plan for your life. God knows this is true of me, and I, it's, not a, it's not trying to be anything other than just genuine before the Lord. But I realize God's given me this church to pastor, and I know that, and I try to pastor this church as well as I know how to do it. I'm sure I, I found there's others could do it much better, but nevertheless, I'm thankful God gives me a place of service. But I don't just try to pastor this church and shun everyone else. The reality of this town is small enough that I know this sounds absurd, and please don't, take, don't read anything into this. Take everything I say at face value, because that's the only way I know to give it to you, all right? The cookies are always on the bottom shelf if I make them, all right? So don't look on the top shelf, because you won't get them there. I, I feel like God sometimes, I try to just pastor this town. I know this church is my responsibility in pastoring this church, but there's a whole lot of people in this town that I'm not their pastor, but they need someone to be a pastor to them. It's a small enough town that I can get to know a whole lot of people and try to help and encourage a lot of people. Nothing special here, but I know someone I can introduce them to that has all the power to give them the victory of whatever they're going through in their life. And I just want to encourage them and strengthen them and let them know Christ has a purpose and a plan. But not only that, in this same verse, verse 24, he says, And God hath given thee all them that sail with thee. God's provisions for us. As I said earlier, people have come and gone through our church, and, I, and, and we hate to see anyone leave, Mark and Tracy. We hate to see anyone leave our church. But just because they leave this local area or this body of believers doesn't mean that they become my enemy. Seriously. Galena, the church that she goes to there in New Mexico, had Brother Ray McCormick come and preach a revival or something for y'all. So she said the other day, yesterday, she said, you think we can meet, I can go see Brother Ray while we're in town? I said, no, nah, we don't run around with that riffraff. <laughs> Troublemaker. How would I dare introduce anyone else to another Baptist preacher in, in this proximity? No way. Never going to happen. Yes, it's going to happen. But Ray and I are friends. Hey, Brother Gary Dexter and our friends, right? Hey, David and Cindy and I are friends. These are people that don't go to this church that one time may have or visited. Mark and Tracy, are we still friends? We're still friends. Mike and Darlene, we're still friends. 
and others and others and others. Listen, where they go, this church, another church, it does break my heart when they get out of church. It breaks my heart when they get out of church. Or when they get out of a Bible preaching church and move into some other church that has less of a stand on the Bible. We're not perfect, but I believe we try to take the right stand on the Bible. And that does hurt. That doesn't make him my enemy, though. He says, listen, I promise you that all that I've given you, he says to Paul, all that are with thee will be saved. Can I say to you tonight, I know nothing about your salvation, honestly, unless you've told me and testified of it, but even that, I can't see your heart. I can't see the conversion that took place there. And you can't see mine. But here's the amazing thing. People may criticize salvation sometimes. Well, I don't believe that kids can really get saved. I don't believe at a certain age. And look at, you think they really got saved? Look at their life. I don't know. But I can guarantee you this. Everyone that got saved is saved. Period. God's provision is, is there. Irregardless. If a person believeth upon him as their personal Savior and asketh him to come in their heart and repent of their sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and save us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness, Right? And then lastly, in verse 44, the Bible says, And the rest, some on boards and some on broken pieces of ship, and so it came to pass that they all escaped, all safe to land. God's always able to deliver us. He's always able to deliver us. We sing songs about it. We just have a hard time believing it, don't we? He's able to deliver us. He'll deliver us. I've told you this in the past, but if you had, if we backed up 15 years, well, longer than that, if, you, if we backed up 17, 18 years ago, 18 years ago, I guess, if you'd have come to me and you'd have said, you're someday going to be pastoring a church, in Arizona City, Arizona, I would have said, you're nuts. I wasn't in front of the people kind of person. I very much enjoy, and I've told you this past, my comfort zone is the second man. I like being behind the curtain guy. Listen, I loved it. I loved being a deacon, a Sunday school teacher, and working in the church, and even assistant pastor. I loved all that stuff behind it. He's no one... It was just, give me the work to do and let me just get it done. You know, I just love that, you know. I just love that. I love looking for those things that can be done. But God had that for a time in my life, but he has something for another time in my life. First of all, if you told me I was leaving the land where my wife and I live, we just said, there's no way. <laughs> we loved it there. We'll never leave here. I never said those words, but if you'd have asked me, I probably would have. Because we knew God had given us that. He'd given us the job I had. He'd given us the family that we'd, he'd allowed us to have started. And, I, and I, I, it was amazing. But then in 1998, of April 1998, the Lord said, I got something else I'd like you to do. Would you surrender to preach the gospel? I'm already teaching a class in junior church. and I'm already having a lot of fun at the church, working a bus route and things. He said, would you, would you surrender to preach the the gospel and be a preacher and not only that but I want you to go and start a church and what do you tell the Lord I mean seriously you say no I didn't want to say no I was fearful to say yes but it was more fearful to say no I mean really yay Lord and on the altar I was. My wife and I for a week, maybe three or four days, we talk about it every day. Do you really? Us? Really? I'm, 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 that's exactly the way it went. And we finally realized this is the Lord. We met with our pastor and told him what we're laying on our heart. 
He was excited about it. I enrolled in Bible college. Graduated and moved to Arizona. Knowing it's where God brought us. We was asked several times we were back there this time by different people. So, do you think you'll ever come back? My exact phrase to everyone that asked me that question was, nope, never. You say, how can you have, have that arrogance? It's not an arrogance. I promise you it's not an arrogance. God has moved us and called us. and He's given us a promise. And we're looking for his provision. And we really need his power. And if it, anything changed, it'd be like getting off the ship. If I change any of his story for me, it's like getting off the ship. Now that's his story for me and for my wife. What about each of you in this room? What's his story for you? Are you one of the prisoners on the ship that your life is in danger because someone says, Wah! then you better have a witness before the centurion. The centurion says, no, no, no. We're all going to get off here together. Don't live your life secrets, my whole point. Live your life openly. Because God will do something for you that he's never done. Morialis, New Mexico. Have you ever know, been there? Even our New Mexican friends have not been there. Morialis, New Mexico. Didn't even know the place existed until about 3.30 a.m. Tuesday morning. And alongside the road, broken down, a guy drives up that owns a repair shop. And when he realized he could not fix it because it was a computer, I said, well, give me a tow towing company. He said, you just passed one 30 minutes ago called Wagon Wheel Towing. And while he was pulling off his phone to give me the number, the tow truck driver of that company drove up. Honestly. Our family could have been in danger with no one around that we knew and no way to get anywhere. But God said, listen, I've got a plan for you. And his ways are not our ways. See, my way was to be home about 10 o'clock Tuesday morning. Instead, we got home about 11 o'clock Wednesday morning and turned around and left again Thursday morning and got home at 3.30 Friday morning. His ways are not my ways. His thoughts are not my thoughts. But he has a plan for me. He has a plan for you. But do we just really want to stay on the ship through the storm sometimes? We just need to stay on the ship. But you don't know what I'm going through. You're right. You're exactly right. I don't. And not another ship, as far as we know in the world, knew what this ship was going through. <coughs> right? And the ship didn't survive. But the ship fulfilled God's purpose by getting them close enough to land where they could swim. And God broke the ship up so that there was pieces of the ship that the other that couldn't swim could get to shore on. Well, that's silly. You really think God did that? No, I know God did that. So sometimes our life, we have to get somewhere on a piece of something. But when all 276 of them was on land that counted together, how many of you think that they were thankful to be on the land, whether it be by swimming or by a piece of the Lord? They were thankful that they was all there and no one was lost, right? Because the centurion was going to, I mean, the, the guard was going to kill the prisoners, but now the prisoners are still intact. And you know why all this happened? Because they didn't get off the ship. Because Paul said, the Lord has told me I have to stand before Caesar. It's not what he wanted to do with his life, but it's what God chose him to do with his life. And God made sure that he, his plan was fulfilled, right? We just got to give ourselves to him. Not just know God's word, 
Not just know about the Savior, but believe upon Him and then believe that He'll work through us for His good pleasure and for His glory. And how do you not enjoy the ride when God's being pleased? Seriously. When the captain of the ship is happy, everybody on the ship's going to be happy. So let's make sure we trust Him. Amen. Lord, we come to you tonight. I thank you for this day. Thank you for this lesson tonight from your word. Thank you, Lord, for what you've done for us and how you've met our needs and provided for us over and over and over and over again. Well, there's an amazing, amazing story that you've given us in our life. Help us to look for that story. Help us, first of all, look that we have you as our Savior and the, the lead of our story, Lord, the, is Christ in us. And then, Lord, help us to look at our life and see how you've worked through us being a witness in time of trouble, being a witness in time of turmoil. Help us, Lord, to be empowered and strengthened, encouraged to not live our life as some secret service Christian, but that our life would not be hid in a corner, but our life would be a light upon a hill, shining bright for all to see that we may guide them to the Savior. Thank you, Lord, for all that you've done for us. Thank you for your power, your protection, your provision. Thank you, Lord, for your plan and your purpose for our life. Help us to understand it and embrace it. Help us to live for you all the days of our life. Be with us now. Bring us back safe again at the appointed time. Lord, we lift up our up-and-coming services, the revival, Lord, and the meeting next week with the tour group. Lord, use these things for your glory, for our betterment, for our strengthening. We love you, and thank you for all that you do for us in Christ's name. Amen.